our text this morning, as you might have guessed, is in Matthew chapter 6. I'll let you turn there um, as we get into it. Uh, the story goes, you know, whether, whether or not it's fully true, we might not ever know, but the story goes that in 1962, um, John F. Kennedy visited the, the NASA Space Center. And during his visit, he saw a janitor carrying a broom. So he, he, he broke away from his tour and, and introduced himself and asked the man, uh, what are you doing? And the janitor's reply to him was, Mr. President, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. <laughs> this, this story is told often in, in leadership classes and courses and seminars, uh, used normally to show the, the purpose of a, a company's mission and vision. And just how important it is to have a, a clear statement that can go all the way from uh, the ones who are getting strapped into the Apollo 11 uh, rocket all the way down to the one who is sweeping up after the, the mathematicians and uh, people in the cafeteria to make all of this possible. Uh, it's important for everyone to know it, everyone to buy into it, um, from the rocket scientists to the janitors. I think... If we also keep in mind that this is 1962, seven years before uh, the Apollo 11 mission in 1969, and this janitor said he wasn't just sweeping floors, not just taking out the rubbish or uh, sanitizing the bathroom. Uh, to him, he was putting a man on the moon. So this, this janitor, he, he gave this reply seven years before the Apollo 11 mission. And even seven years before this, he wasn't just sweeping floors or taking out rubbish or sanitizing the bathroom. To him, he was putting a man on the moon. He was never going to be the one taking that giant leap for mankind, but, but for him, his work was transformed by this bit of perspective. He looked outward, away from himself, toward, toward a goal that was different from his own interests. Right? His response was not, Mr. President, I'm paying off my mortgage. He had a perspective. I think we also often need a bit of perspective. Uh, once again, to be told to look beyond ourselves. I hear it myself when I pray with Jasmine, my wife, before bed. I, I hear it from um, preachers whose only thing seems to be how to, how to get to a new uh, layer or level of, of blessing. I see it in all the, the best-selling titles at the Christian bookstore where I can pick up books on everything from how to know God's special purpose for my life, how to get rid of the spiritual bondage of financial burden, or how to uh, be done wrestling with the power of sin uh, once I received a, a particular blessing or, or anointing. I see these things, and, and maybe this is only me, and I'm putting this into the minds of other people, but I, I think I tend to think about myself the most. Uh, so I tend to pray about myself the most. What I need, what I want, what will make my life or my friends' lives easier. Uh, I pray for the people who disagree with me, but not necessarily for them. I pray so that they might agree with me, right? <laughs> I, pray, I pray for myself and the things I care most about. And I, I'm not sure that's ever going to change. I don't think I'll ever graduate from that. It was in our newsletter just a couple of weeks ago, that uh, you can't pray for someone you don't love. It's Billy Graham who said that. And I think that's exactly the point of our text today. We, prayer changes our perspective. You, you can't pray for someone uh, you don't love. Because as you pray for them, you will come to, uh, come to care for them. Prayer changes our perspective because prayer, on one level, is an expression of our desire. But I think what we need is not only for prayer to change our perspective, but for our perspective of prayer to change. And that's exactly where our passage in Matthew takes us this morning. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be in verse 10. And we're in the middle of looking at the Lord's prayer, taking it sort of line by line. And last week we focused, like Jeanette reminded us, on the worth and the beauty of God captured in the little phrase, hallowed be your name. But this week, the next two requests Jesus teaches us to make uh, continue to shape our perspective when we come to prayer. Because all three of these first uh, three requests center around God's glory, meaning his, his inherent perfection and beauty, his, his otherness, his, his godness. And this week we'll see once again how a concern for God himself will not only shape how we pray, but who we are. So would you 
read with me from Matthew chapter 6. I'll have it up on the screen for you if you need it. I'll start in verse 9. Jesus said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is God's word. The, the two lines, as I mentioned, that I want to draw your attention to this morning are in verse 10. There's two lines, your, your kingdom come and your will be done. For each of these lines, I want us to ask three questions. First, what does it mean when we say this? What does it mean when we say your kingdom come? Second, what, what do we seek when we pray it? What are we actually asking the Lord to do? And, and finally, what would this require from us? So what does it mean? What do we seek when we pray it? And thirdly, what does this require of me? So we'll, we'll dive right in. What does Jesus mean when he teaches us to pray, uh, God's kingdom come? What is the kingdom of God? This is not a, a small question. Or we, could, we could fill books in dealing with all that the Bible says about this. And that's just not even getting to uh, the differing views on, on what exactly this uh, will play out to look like. The, the kingdom of God is one of the, the big themes that stretches from the beginning to the end of Scripture. The kingdom of God is, is one of uh, these, these big things that the Bible has to say. He is uh, the creator of the ends of the earth, and so he is Lord over it. And so on the one hand, the kingdom of God is, is eternal. It stretches as, as far as he does. It is as, as big and as vast as time itself. And so God's kingdom, it, it goes into the, into the past. Go. But his kingdom is also future, Right? That's the, the, the prayer of Scripture. Right? As Christians, we, we believe what Jesus told his disciples, that he would return, and he would return in power at the end of this present evil age, and that all things, we're told, will be put under his feet, and, that, and then he will give all these things over to the Father. It's just a way to say that he will reign as king over everything. And so the, the final victory, when Satan is cast into hell forever and, and God recreates heaven and earth once and for all, free from the stain and corruption of sin, this is uh, the future kingdom, the, what we call the consummation of all things. So from creation, God is king. And at, at the consummation of all things, he will be king forever in the new heavens and new earth. And in this kingdom, there will be no more pain no more death. In this perfect kingdom, even the, the temptation to sin and rebel against God will be stripped away as, as we dwell forever in his perfect presence. A freedom that, that we've never known and an enjoyment of God that we've never tasted here on earth will be ours forever. This is a, a good kingdom to, to look forward to, this future kingdom. Now, I did, here, I think we need to address a little bit of something because Christians disagree over some of the order of things uh, between now and this final kingdom, before this final victory. And I think this morning, as we look at Jesus' words, we, we don't actually need to solve the puzzles of all that what will happen uh, before the end of time. We, we don't need to have a, a timeline of, of end times events buttoned up to pray this prayer, firstly because Jesus doesn't intro this prayer with a buttoned up timeline of events, but secondly, because the kingdom of God stretches into the past, and because it will come perfectly in the future, uh, the teaching of the kingdom of God uh, since the ministry of Jesus has always been uh, pulling between this already and a not yet. Uh, the, the kingdom of, of God is, is here and now. It is present, but it is also not yet. And just to to ground this in, in Scripture quickly, uh, during his earthly ministry, Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees. He was called the servant of Satan for casting out demons. And so he, he responds just a couple chapters after our text here in Matthew 12. He says in verse 31 that if it's by the Spirit of God I cast out demons, not by Satan as you suggest, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And then the kingdom of God, he says, has, has overtaken you. It's, it's already here. 
And, and since we know that Jesus cast out demons by the Spirit of God, there is a sense in which the kingdom of God was there present at the time of his ministry. Wasn't that actually just his, his proclamation when he started? It was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. It's, it's right around the corner. And so there is some way in which uh, the kingdom of God is already present. God reigns in the hearts of all who believe in him. That's why uh, Paul uses the picture of, of two kingdoms in the book of Colossians uh, when he talks about conversion. We were enemies of God, he says, but we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of, of God's beloved son. And so when we speak of the kingdom, we, we have to, to sit in the tension of the already present kingdom as Jesus reigns and rules in the hearts of his followers and the, the not yet of the eternal kingdom. And it doesn't matter what happens in between because until we get to the not yet, we'll always be in this already and not yet. So if this is what we mean when we speak of the kingdom of God, then the question we need to ask is, is what is it we seek when we pray this? If God's kingdom is present, but not in its fullness, if God's kingdom is future, at the finish line of the earthly kingdom, what is it we seek when we are praying this prayer? I think when, when we pray your kingdom come, we're, we're praying for at least three things. We're praying for his rule to be expanded and experienced, and for his rule to be expedited, just to keep them all with the same letter. There we go. So first, when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we pray for his rule to be expanded and experienced. This is because the, the already of his kingdom is present wherever Jesus reigns in our hearts. And so as we, as we pray your kingdom come, we, we pray that uh, his rule would be experienced in this world now as people come to faith in Jesus. We know many who have rejected his authority and his, his rule over their lives. And so for us to pray your kingdom come is on one level to pray for this gospel of the kingdom that Jesus proclaims. This is what Jesus preached when, when he came. You can just look up at the beginning of, of chapter 4. This is what Jesus was doing before the Sermon on the Mount, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he handed that gospel to his followers. And so as we, as we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying that, that this work would, would go out and that many people would be transferred, as his followers have, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That, that Christ would come to reign in their hearts, and that his kingdom would come in this way. But of course, we, we're also praying for God's rule to be expedited, for it to, to come quickly. Right? We, um, we wait with eager longing for the end of all things. This was the prayer of, of Paul, the, the apostle, at the end of his uh, first letter to the Corinthians. And if you read Revelation, it, it's the very final prayer in the Bible. Just one verse back from the end. Revelation 22, verse 20, Jesus says to us, Surely I am coming soon. And, and the response to him is, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Someone prayed it this morning. So we're seeking two things. We, we pray that the already of this kingdom would expand and, and deepen in its experience. And we pray that the not yet of this kingdom would be expedited, quickened, your kingdom come is a cry for the Lord to reign in righteousness now and forever. And so if, if this is the case, we, we come now to our, our third question. What does this require of us? I think we could, we could say a lot of things, because uh, as we pointed out last week, this prayer of Jesus is a, a deep well. It's, it's not even a well, it's the whole... Um, water table beneath the, the, the ground of um, this prayer that we would have to um, suck everything out of if we were going to get everything out of this prayer. So we can't do it all, especially not in a couple of Sundays. But for now, let's take these three things. What does this prayer require of us if we are to pray it sincerely? If we are to pray, your kingdom come. I think three things, expectation, alignment, and participation. So firstly, it requires expectation. Do we long for heaven? We, we sing a song at this church, and we'll sing it at the end of that, that begins, How I long to breathe the air of heaven. 
Does the thought of heaven excite you? I find that, that many of my own struggles, whether temptations or trials, can be dampened a bit by the thought of heaven. They're made a, a little bit less sharp, a little bit less bitter. And I think this accords well with Scripture because the Apostle Peter, uh, who was writing to a, a persecuted church, writing to Christians suffering for the sake of the gospel, he begins his first letter with a reminder of the inheritance that is theirs, of this everlasting kingdom that, that's sitting there waiting. He says that they have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, kept in heaven for them, kept by God who is also keeping them, he says. So for Peter, the, the thought of heaven is the first treatment for all the ills and ailments of this world. This life is not all there is. And if we would pray this prayer, we, we first of all need to lift our eyes to heaven, uh, to, to be um, shaped by the expectation of eternal life. Which brings us to the second thing this requires of us. Alignment. There are many preachers out there, many um, preachers both within the church and outside the church, whether it's the, the marketing specialists in the media or people who actually uh, parade themselves as pastors who preach for us to focus on ourselves. My message would be don't, don't be deceived by worldly preachers who focus too much on this life. And of course, there is, there's much to do and, and much of God's blessing to experience in this life. I don't mean we should go live in a desert and just meditate on heaven, but uh, the Christian's call is not to live um, our best life now, meaning as many cars and, and houses and things as possible. Right, just after this prayer, Jesus will tell us to treasure um, what is in heaven, not things here. Don't, don't put your treasure where things can be destroyed or taken. The Christian's call is not to live our best life now unless this best life is filled with the things that we can take with us to heaven. Right? To, to um, align ourselves with the kingdom of God is to love what heaven loves. Right? The enjoyment of God and his rule, the sweetness of relationship with him, the, the desire to know him more. The only way to live our best life now is to look forward to heaven and to treasure what will last until we reach it. That's what Jesus teaches in just a few verses. But to be aligned with heaven means not only to love the things that we will love there, but to hate what heaven hates. Right? In heaven there will be no sin because we will be dwelling in God's very presence, unmediated by, by anything other than our capacity as creatures not to be able to take him in fully. So there will be no sin in heaven because we will be in God's presence. And if, if sin will have no part of our life in heaven, then we cannot pray now, thy kingdom come without humbling ourselves before a perfect God, re repenting for our sin, without taking into serious consideration what it means to ask that for my own um, still sinful heart, even as I am um, made alive with Christ. One writer said this. He said, this petition, this request, is, is only offered rightly to God by those who begin with themselves are those who pray that they may be purified from all the corruptions which disturb the peace um, and impair the purity of God's kingdom. This petition is only offered rightly by those who pray that they may be purified from all the corruptions which disturb the peace and impair the purity of God's kingdom. Finally, participation. In a sense, training ourselves to delight in heaven and despise our sin is participation in God's kingdom. But there's another way in which we are called to participate. We cannot twist God's arm into fulfilling his own plan for the end of time. Jesus said himself, no one knows the day or hour when Christ will return, but we're given signs of the seasons. And what we are called to do is to participate with God in expanding the already of this kingdom while we wait for than not yet. This gospel of the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed has been given to us as well. So, for those of us who are Christians, we ask, is the gospel of the kingdom on our tongue? Have we stored the message of our salvation in our hearts so that it's, it's ready to spill out when we are asked? 
Have you prayed this week that, that the Lord might prepare you and prepare one other person who doesn't know him to, to meet together and have a conversation about the kingdom of God? As we pray this, we should let the prayer that God's kingdom come expand our perspective and give us eyes to see the lost who wander in this kingdom of darkness until they are transferred into the kingdom of light. We should let this prayer ignite a fire in us to participate in God's great work. This prayer which Jesus teaches us is first and foremost a pattern. We established that the first week. He's given us more than just words to memorize, although it's, it's a good idea to memorize this prayer. He's given us a, a pattern and principles for how we pray. And these first three lines, uh, let your name be kept holy, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, these all do essentially the same thing. But they're, they're different enough from each other that we're given a clearer picture when we look at them individually. After all, what is it to, to keep God's name holy if it's not to recognize his rule as king over all things? His, his is the right and the authority because of his holiness. And, and what is it to do his will if not to recognize that his holiness and his authority have, uh, as a king have uh, a significant effect on the way we should live our lives? And so in their, in their essence, all three of these re- requests are getting to the same thing. They're getting to the one thing, God's glory. And so as Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us first to come to God and to be sharply aware of his glory. So aware that, that the requests we make of God make much of his own glory. We talked about how prayer has an influence on us, how prayer gives us a different perspective. We also talked about how we need to get a, a different perspective on prayer. This is how Jesus approaches by first coming to the glory of God before we turn to our, our own requests. So now as we turn to this, this third request in the first half of the Lord's Prayer, we keep this glory of God in mind. Right? Because the final request is, let your will be done. And as we, as we think on this, we have to, again, go back to our three questions. What does it mean? What, what do we mean when we ask it, and what does that require of us? So what do we mean when we pray for God's will to be done? Firstly, we need to, to define a little bit what we mean by his will. I'm sure if we asked, we'd have a, a lot of different answers. One helpful distinction that, that comes to us from the Bible, not, not in words, but, but painted throughout Scripture, is to make a separation in our minds between God's will of decree and his will of desire. God's will of decree and his will of desire. His will of decree is his, his plan for all things. It's what Paul says in, in Ephesians 1 and verse 11. He says, God is the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will. His will there is, is not the same thing as um, the, the will of his decree because it's, it's what he will work all things according to. This is fixed, unchanging. He, he is not surprised by the future the way we are. God has not only seen the future, but planned it as well. From the perspective of eternity, his plan is, is fixed. So this is, in, in the first place, not the will that we're asking to be done. Because we know God will accomplish all his purposes. He will work all things according to the counsel of his will, the way Paul teaches us. So what we pray to be done is the will of God's desire. And this will of desire is, is, I think, normally what we think of when we think and speak of God's will. We're thinking about what, what God wants for us to do, what decisions he would have us make. Right? God's will of desire was that Adam and Eve not eat the fruit that was forbidden, and yet they did it. His will of desire is that mankind stop sinning, that, that we promote justice and righteousness, that we worship him rightly for our own good, yet uh, by nature, we do not do these things. So when we pray, your will be done, we're asking that God's will of desire be imprinted on every heart in humble obedience to his rule as a king and his holiness as God. So this is what we mean when we pray for God's will to be done. What are we seeking when we pray this? 
I think, in short, that God's rule is honored and obeyed. Just as his holiness demands worship, right, that we promote God among the nations and people who don't know him, just as his righteous rule demands that we make his will known, so this prayer that his will be done means that we seek to see God's rule honored and obeyed in the world. And to seek that God be promoted in honor and obedience is simply to obey Jesus' command to us to make disciples. And Jesus said to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Now, we cannot obey God's will if we don't know God's will. But he has revealed his will for us in his word. Paul, in, in one sentence, gives us enough work for a lifetime in, in regards to hearing, listening, and doing God's will. And to the Thessalonians, he says, this is God's will for you, your holiness, your sanctification, your growth to look more like God. So in, in one sense, to pray thy will be done is to ask that the world would humble themselves before God in obedience to his will. That, that we all promote justice and, and righteousness and we walk with humility before God. That we, we honor and thank him for what he has made. So this is what we ask when we come to this petition. What does this require of us? To pray thy will be done. What, what, what demands does that make of us if we're going to pray it in sincerity? I think at the very least to pray this requires of us to place the glory of God as the foundation of our prayer. To pray your will be done requires us to place the glory of God as the foundation of all our prayer. Here's what I mean. Like we said, these first three requests teach us to approach prayer with a view of God that promotes his holiness, his rule, and his will. In these three requests, we see that God is is the most valuable, the most worthy, the most glorious thing in in all of existence. He is the the personal source of of all that there is. Everything has come from him. We're told that that without him, nothing was made that that was made. All things flow back to him. He is the the righteous king who rules perfectly. So when when we grasp these things that are in these first three requests, we, we gain the perspective that we so badly need. We gain perspective for our prayer so that even as we, we see God in our approach to him, we're, we're transformed by our vision of him and our request change as well. Because right? we're, we're taught from our own human nature to place ourselves at the center of all things. Especially in our, our Western culture, we've turned this into an idol and not even one that we're ashamed of, one we're happy to uh, parade around and, um, and worship but when we come to this prayer, we're not taught to love ourself or to be ourself or to follow our heart or to do what's best for you no matter what. When we come to this prayer, if we pray it as it was intended, we must radically decenter ourselves. Because these first three lines place God so at the center of the universe and promote him so highly as the, the best good for, for all things, and especially for our lives, that, that to pray, your will be done, is, is in some ways the capstone to this first half of the prayer. It's to set God's glory as the foundation, as the center of the prayer. Illustrate this with what one pastor says. He says it doesn't take a Christian to pray the second half of this prayer. Right? At least not the desire for those things, for food, forgiveness, for protection from evil. These kind of things pagans pray for all the time. But it takes a heart transformed by the Spirit of God to put faith in the God of all things and to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done. And this perspective ought to reshape our prayers. Of course, it's, it's not wrong to bring our requests to God no matter how small. Right? That's what Jesus taught us in the approach to the prayer, that, that he knows them before they're even on our lips. He's, he's our father who knows that when a hair falls from our heads. He, he's not too far to hear you or too unkind to turn a, a deaf ear to our earnest request. 
We are invited by the Bible to cast our cares on God, specifically because he cares for us. I've prayed often in the last month that our, our oldest child would just stay asleep so that Jasmine and I can get a little bit more rest. It's a lot of prayers offered between 1 and 4 a.m. I've also prayed for those with, with a terminal diagnosis to be given more time. All of our requests, big and small, enter before the presence of a loving Father. But as much as we are invited to cast our cares upon God, we are called also to temper them with a sharp awareness of his holiness and his rule. I think sometimes we lose sight of this. Because I often hear Christians speak of answered prayer and unanswered prayer. I even heard one, one speaker pres, um, talk about answered prayer as a sign of blessing from God. They had had an increase in answered prayer because of some reason or another. I think we often forget that God has every right to answer a prayer as he wishes. Right, one pastor from the UK, co-founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, a guy named Pete Grieg, he, he illustrates what we mean by answered prayer with, with a traffic light. And sometimes God answers with a green light. It's a yes, straight away. Sometimes he answers with a red light. It's a no, straight away. Sometimes his response seems slow in coming. But, but this, again, is, is not unanswered prayer. It might simply be a, a yellow light or a, a, a not yet. Maybe the thing that we're praying for is good, but it's, it's not the right time. So to pray, your will be done, requires that we actually put our trust in God and we trust his answer to our prayers, whether it be yes, no, or wait a minute. After all, he is eternal. He is perfectly wise. It's very well possible that we ask for things that are not good for us, even if we think they are. And so as we come to close, let me just illustrate this point. I have a, a not quite two-year-old son. And most of you have seen him tearing around church most Sundays. He's got a strong will, a massive curiosity, and, and a desire to play constantly. It's wonderful. <laughs> but he never stops. Uh, and just yesterday, we were at the, the Matacana market, and I, I took him, because he needed some stimulation, I, I took him to the river to see the eels under the dock. And he, he loved them. He loved looking over the edge, and he was pointing and, and ooing and, and eyeing at them. And, and all the while, I had one careful hand around his waist. But once he kind of got used to where he was standing, when his trepidation wore off, he decided he wanted to get as close to them as possible. And so all of a sudden, the, the pressure against my hand began to, to grow as he was pushing towards the water. And eventually, he got up from where we had crouched and was standing, leaning over the, the edge of the water, trying to get as close to them as possible to play with them. He, he tried to get in the river. And he, you know, he was whining to let me know that he thought I was wrong. <laughs> and how many here think I should have let him off the dock? Okay, a couple of you. A couple of you who think that would be good. He can't fish yet, so there's, there's no real benefit. No, we, we know, of, of course not. He, he can't see far enough into the future to know what is a mistake and what might hurt him. He hasn't experienced enough of, enough of life to know what might be dangerous. And I'm, I'm young. We can could round it out to 30. And for every one of my son's years of life, I've lived 15. This gives me a, a greater wisdom than his. I can see farther, I know better, and I'm still young. How much more wisdom does God have? How much greater is his knowledge? I love my son. I earnestly desire his joy. I want him to be happy. How much more does God desire our joy, our happiness? And yet, I know that should my son tip himself into the river, he, he won't experience joy. <laughs> he'll be afraid. He'll be cold. That's, that's if he gets out. Quickly enough, I don't know what would happen if he got washed downstream towards that 20 to 30 foot waterfall that's waiting for him there. 
He will not experience joy, even if he thinks so. So for us to pray, your will be done, is to recognize that as much as I have more knowledge than my son, God has so much more knowledge than we do. His wisdom far exceeds ours. His desire for our joy far exceeds ours. And, and so when we come to pray, of course, bring every care that you have to God. You, you desire to be married, pray. You uh, desire that um, you need a parking spot in central Auckland on a, on a Monday morning or somewhere close to the market on, on a Saturday in Matacana, pray. You, you desire that there's just one more pepper steak pie left at Savan's, even though it's late in the day and you know there probably won't be. That's fine. Pray. But recall that there is a trajectory of this world that stretches into everlasting life, a kingdom that, that cannot be shaken and which will never fade. Remember when you come to pray that there is a God who is worthy of worship and we have hearts that resist his rule. Remember that, that what may seem to us to be an unfair, an unyielding, or an unloving no, or not yet, may actually be the hand of the one who knows all, and who sees all, and who loves us beyond what we can know. So uh, as we go from this place this morning, let these first three lines grant us all a bit of perspective. I pray that they would uh, place God in his proper place. Let them also place you in his story, the one that stretches from eternity past to eternity future and his ruling and reigning. Let them ignite in you a desire to see the heavenly kingdom and a passion to work towards his reign and in this world now. Let his greatness stir in us an expectant humility as we come before a holy and righteous and loving father with our requests, knowing that he cares for us. Let's pray. Great God of, of all things, King of creation, ruler of all eternity, would you, would you teach us to see you for who you are, to look forward to everlasting life with you and all that it will bring. Would you teach us to humble ourselves before you and to pray that, that your will would be done in our lives. Thank you that you are a loving Father and a wise God. We pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen.